Hello everyone, my name is Paul Felix. I'm the founder of LeapFrog BI. Today, I'm going to be talking about a very important topic, and that is the foundation ETL design pattern. If you're building a data warehouse or a data mart, then the bulk of your resources are going to be spent creating this process, which is going to extract data from your systems of record, perform some number of transformations, maybe to apply business rules or deal with data quality issues, and then load that data into your target data warehouse model. If that's the case, if we're going to spend the bulk of our resources building this process, it goes without saying that we need to think about how we want that process to behave. What steps are we going to go through when we build that process? Um, and that's what we're going to do here in this video. So what's the goal? How do we want this system to behave? What are the characteristics we're looking for? Some of them are pretty intuitive. We want the system to be functional. We want the system to be resilient. It can't be failing all of the time, and it needs to deal with things like uh, minor data profile changes. It needs to be efficient. The less efficient the process is, the more we're going to spend on hardware and software licensing, uh, air conditioning in our data center, and ongoing monitoring. So efficiency is extremely important. Accuracy, of course, everything we do has to be 100% accurate when it comes to data warehousing. If it's not, then the first thing that's going to happen is our business users are going to see that inaccuracy. And that's going to deteriorate their confidence in this data warehouse. That's the last thing we want to do. We want to give them every incentive to utilize this repository to make better decisions. So accuracy is extremely important. Now, in addition to all of those things, which I think we could agree that probably since the beginning of data warehousing time, everyone would agree that those were the characteristics that we're looking for. But data warehousing hasn't had a, a, a spotless record. It's had plenty of failures. And if I had to boil all of those, or maybe the consensus view of why data warehousing fails, I would say it's probably because data warehousing is a very rigid process where a business's requirements are always changing. So if we have this rigid process over here that takes us 6, 12 months or more to create, meanwhile, we've collected requirements at the beginning of the process that by the time we actually develop the warehouse are no longer the same requirements, then we're setting ourselves up for failure. And of course, Agile is a, is a development methodology. I'm not going to go into all the details here, but the idea here is to solve some of those types of problems, we're going to develop in an iterative way. We're going to get some production-ready code out there regularly. Um, we're going to uh, collect requirements on an ongoing basis. So Agile, I believe, is key to data warehousing success. But to be Agile, we have to plan for that as well. And part of that planning is in this upfront ETL design pattern that we are going to use as our foundation going forward. So what is an Agile ETL design pattern? Well, first of all, the, the design pattern obviously has to be flexible. Uh, we got to be able to tell our business users, you know what, you give me your best requirements today, and if they change tomorrow, no sweat. I'm going to be able to deal with that change. It's not going to cost us a lot of rework. Um, we're going to go forward with it and, and continue to make this process better and better. So it's got to be flexible. It has to be standards-based. We can't just have cowboy coding going on all the time because, you know, one simple reason that doesn't work is if one developer... Uh, uh, leaves the team, another one comes in, it's going to take that new developer um, a lot of time just to reverse engineer the, the, the work that had already been done. That's a very inefficient process, and standards help solve those types of problems. Extensibility. While we have this foundation design pattern, and it's extremely important, we also realize that there are going to be times that it's not going to meet our needs. We're going to have to make some minor adjustments, so we have to plan for that extensibility. Simple. Simplicity is is always the goal. And frankly, what we're going to start with here in a minute is the simplest pattern that we could use. And from that point on, we're going to be compromising simplicity to gain some other characteristics. And we have to always be cognitive of those compromises. Decoupling. Decoupling is, is extremely important as well. I'm, I'm going to refer to a lot of these processes that we're going to make uh, very discrete processes as being components. And I feel like components need to be built in a way that we can pull a component out and put another one in without disrupting the array of dependencies that's always around these large data flows or ETL processes. So decoupling is another characteristic that we're looking for. 
Okay, so all that said, let's look at the actual design pattern. The simplest thing we could do is we could, in one step, take all of our code, put it in one big chunk, pull the data out of a system of record, and load it into a target data warehouse model. Well, that's, I think you could say, um, a standard, but you could also say it's the lack of a standard because, you know, that they would be basically the same thing. Um, it's possible for this to be accurate. I don't know that I would say it's simple because you're going to have a lot of logic built in this one big chunk of code, and that's going to get potentially pretty messy. All these other characteristics, such as functionality, it absolutely is not going to meet our goals of data warehousing. It's not going to be fully functional. The only way this could be fully functional is if our data persistence requirements completely aligned with our presentation model. And that's nearly never the case. It's certainly not the case if we want to be flexible. If I'm going to go to the business and say, um, it's okay if you change your mind two weeks from now about how you want to track history on this uh, product attribute, for example, the only way I can do that is if I know that I've got the data to back that up. And I won't necessarily know that if I'm taking an approach like this. I'm at the, 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 uh, the mercy of my system of record. Okay, so there's a lot of other reasons why this particular approach is not going to meet all of the needs. Um, however, if this meets your needs, then this is exactly what you should do. Typically, it will not. So the first thing we're going to do is put in a repository in the middle. And this is going to be the persistent staging area, or the PSA. What is this repository? This is where we are going to store all unique re records that ever enter the system all unique versions of records that ever enter the system. And we're typically not going to start trimming off fields from our data that we collected from the system of record. It's going to be, uh, you know, if we pull, if we pull a tab table in from a system of record, we're going to drop it in PSA exactly like it came from the system of record. And we're going to start keeping a full audit trail of all changes that ever came in from the system. What that does for us is it lets us, um, at any time, take an attribute in the target model and change it from a current basis, an SCD1 version, to a history tracked version without compromising data, without, without having to say, you know what, we can only do that on a going forward basis. I can actually do that in arrears from the point that we started collecting data in PSA. So PSA is, is a, is a critical piece of this design pattern. There's a lot of other benefits to PSA. Um, I'm, I'm going to do an, another video that's focused only on PSA. So I'm going to leave it at that for now. This, what PSA does not do for us is take care of some of the inefficiencies that we're looking at here. One reason why this is inefficient is we have to use an ETL tool to make a connection to our system of record and make another connection to the destination, uh, uh, system and then pull the data out of the system of record into the ETL tools processing, uh, uh memory. And then also pull the target's data out of the, out of that target into the ETL tools memory and perform the merge process. Then push that result set back into the target. That is nearly always a less, uh, um, efficient process as opposed to letting the database engine perform these merge processes. However, we can't let the database engine do it at this point because we have two disparate systems. The system of record might be Oracle. The target might be SQL Server. So what we're going to do is we're going to place a volatile stage in between PSA and the source system. All this is going to be is a, is a table. It's going to be empty. And we're going to ask the ETL tool to collect the data from a system of record and just simply drop it in that stage table trunking the table before they let it's loaded. So every time the, the, the process runs, we're going to delete all records from that stage table and then collect the records from the system of record. But hopefully it's going to be a delta load where we're collecting only the records that have changed since the prior collection process. But now in the stage table, this volatile stage, we're in our target database engine at that point. So we can use the database engine and all the benefits of a database engine that's asset compliant to move the data from a stage table and merge it into our PSA. That's going to be a more efficient process. Now, once we have PSA in place, we have what I call a new reliable source. It has the, the, the characteristics that we want in a reliable source that's going to allow us to change that target model however we want without having to compromise 
we're going to have the data available. We're not going to be at the, at the whims of our systems of record. First thing we got to do is we got to pull records out of that PSA that have not yet been processed into the target model. This is a sourcing step. Obviously, we don't want to collect all records out of PSA every time and load them into the target model. We just want to load the records that we didn't process yet. So that's the first step we're going to do downstream of PSA is source those records. Then we're going to perform some number of transformations. This is where things get to be a little more ad hoc. This depends on what your business rules are, what type of data quality issues you're dealing with, uh, what type of integration challenges you're dealing with. But this is where we're going to perform those types of processes right here in this transform area. Now, you could get more granular with this design pattern and say, you know, if we have this particular type of challenge, it's going to look, the transform is going to look exactly like this, or it's going to look like this in this other scenario. That's completely fine. All I'm doing at this point is giving the foundation pattern that we're going to use to uh, begin our, our uh, final architecture or our final um, design. After we complete those transformations, we need to do one more thing before we try to load that target model. And that is we got to make sure the data is at the right level of granularity. If we're trying to load a dimension, then that data has got to be at a dimension natural key plus effective time grain. That's the only way that will work. And if we're loading a fact table, then the data has got to be at the uh, composite foreign key plus any degenerates grain. So we always have this requirement to ensure that the granularity of our data is is appropriate for the destination object we're trying to load. So that's what this granularity step is going to do for us. And then finally, we're going to load that data into the target, dimension or fact, and then come back and mark those records that we just processed as having been processed in PSA. At that point, that completes this foundation design pattern. It's not all that complex. And a lot of people use very similar or even potentially the exact pattern uh, that I'm proposing here. There's some key elements, though, that I think are, are important enough to, to, uh, to point out. Number one, each of these components, the stage, PSA, uh, sourcing component, so on, they are all designed in a way that they can be um, manipulated without changing the up or downstream lineage. And that, that's a very important characteristic. You know, one reason why is for testing. We want to make sure that we limit the amount of testing that we have to redo every, ha every time we have some type of modern, minor modification. So componentizing the actual code, the way we build the code is very important. Um, flexibility. You know, now we have a, a kind of a two phase load process. We have a data collection process where we're going to be creating this new reliable source, PSA. And then we have a target model load process. Those two now are completely decoupled. There's no reason why we couldn't run the data collection process uh, every 15 minutes and then just run the data warehouse load process once a day. We've got that type of flexibility built into this type of system. Reliability, you know, uh, that this is something that, that goes without saying, but, you know, we're, we're using the database engine once again. And, and to be technical about this, this is an ELT approach. We're going to extract the data. And the first thing we're going to do is load it into our target database engine. Then we're going to use that database engine to perform all the downstream uh, uh, operations, at least as much as possible. Since we're in the database engine and, and we've got asset compliance, we know that if the process fails in the point at, at any point in this process, that transaction that fails is going to be rolled back and we'll know exactly where we are. There's no point in this process that the system could fail and we're going to end up in an unknown state which is extremely important. Okay, so there's a lot of other characteristics about this foundation design pattern. I've used it for, for quite a few years, had great success with it. I hope it helps you a little bit in planning uh, how you're going to design your ETL process. Um, go out there, build your ETL, create a data warehouse that's valuable, contact Leapfrog BI, we'll be happy to help.